Hello, you are watching Frankly Speaking program. I am your host, Turbat Bagrova. Today, our guest is young Azerbaijani scientist Attila Askarov. He is the only Azerbaijani scientist who works for National Aeronautics and Space Administration, briefly NASA. Now we are going to speak about his past leading to NASA, his career and his achievements in this organization. Hello, Mr. Askarov. Hello. Thank you for accepting our invitation and coming to our program. Thanks for having me. Initially, we would like to know about you and your personal achievements. Could you tell us comprehensively about your personal and educational background? Sure, sure, yeah. So I was born in Baku in 1987, and I went to school here. I graduated from high school in 2004. It's the high school number six, the uh, same high school that our president graduated from. And then I, uh, for my bachelor's degree, I, I went to Istanbul Technical University. I studied mechanical engineering there. Then I uh, studied aerospace engineering at uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, that's Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. And got my master's degree in electrical engineering from George Mason University. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the, when I graduated from master's, I uh, had few uh, <coughs> small, few jobs in small startup companies. I, I worked for Transcend Robotics. Um, I worked for a few other startup companies, and then I had my first major job at in Intelsat Technologies, which is a satellite company. And after that, uh, briefly after that, in fact, I saw a, a, a job description online uh, at NASA, and I applied for it. And they called me up for an interview, and then a week later, they told me I got the job. And that was uh, October of last year. And I work, I've been working at NASA since October 10th of 2016. What does your job involve mainly? We are mainly interested about the realm that you are involved in and some comments about NASA. Yes, to answer that question, we need to first start with what NASA is and what, what does it stand for. So <coughs> NASA is mainly, main objective of NASA is space exploration. They explore everything in space, uh, all the way from planets to, to stars to uh, different galaxies. And how do, you, how do you even observe something that is, that is in space, right? You, you, uh, you look at it. And how, how do you look at it? You cannot just look at it with naked eye. You need different instruments to capture different wavelengths of different radiation so that you can paint a, a brighter picture of the object that you're looking at. So na what NASA does, it sends uh, satellites, telescopes, and, and uh, sp space shuttles uh, with different instruments. And each of those instruments have a different objective. They, they look at a different frequency of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And the electromagnetic radiation goes from radio waves and uh, there's uh, microwaves and infrared, invisible light, ultraviolet waves, x-rays, and gamma rays. So the radio waves are the lowest energy and the lowest frequency. Gamma rays have the highest energy and the highest frequency. Um, so each instrument uh, that a spacecraft has has a very narrow reception of electromagnetic waves. Like, for example, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, that's going to be launched uh, probably next year. Uh, will have infrared instrument on it, meaning that it will capture light coming from distant stars and galaxies in infrared, and then it would digitize that data and store it in its system and then send it back to Earth so it can be processed. Um, so then the first part of the question was, how does my, what, what, what my job is, right? I, I had to give you all this background information. I'm, I'm an instrument engineer, um, <coughs> meaning that my, so m my job is mainly uh, with the digital part of uh, instrument for the W first project, and W first stands for Wide Field Infrared Space Telescope. That is the telescope. That's the next generation del telescope that will be launched probably in 2023. So what I mainly do is, uh, or let's, let's, let's go back a little. Let's start with the uh, <coughs> W first instrument. So W first is in is in space somewhere, right? And it's, it's looking at some star or some galaxies being born, and it captures that image in infrared. So it is, uh, it is exposed to, uh, to the galaxy. So it's look, looking, it's, it's camera, infrared camera is directed to a galaxy that, is one that it wants to take a picture of. And, and it's through some time, it, it takes few exposures. And those images, uh, those infrared images are actually are in the pixels of its camera, of its detector, right? The detector is part of the cold electronics. So, so they're, uh, in each instrument, they're cold electronics and warm electronics. The detector is a part of the cold electronics because it has to be cold so that it wouldn't get any thermal noise coming from the uh, hot instruments. 
So once it has been taken the data, that data is stored in charge couple devices, uh, shortly CCD. So there's uh, for each pixel, there is one charge couple device. And that's an analog data, because that's the uh, light intensity coming from the star. And everything is universe is analog. So the most of the sensors, uh, they capture analog data, but they have to convert it to a digital value so it can be stored, so it can be manipulated, so it can be sent to a different, to, to an earth station, for example. Uh, and then from, from a cold electronics to the warm electronics, you have uh, different modules. You have a module called ASIC, that's apl application specific integrated circuit. And the main purpose of that module is to control warm electronics, which are detectors, also store the data from world warm electronics. And uh, like I said, that's an analog data, so it has to be converted to a digital value first. And that's where the ADC comes in. So the ADC stands for Analog to Digital Converter, and it's a part of the ASIC. So once the, once the uh, data is in charge couple devices through the detector, it, it gets passed one by one to the uh, ADC unit, and ADC converts it to a digital value, and, and then sends it to ASIC. And the ASIC manipulates that data if, if necessary, and then sends it to, uh, to a memory, right, to a flash memory. And then later on from the memory, it gets transported back back to Earth, back to the Earth station. Uh, so my job mainly involves designing, troubleshooting, and testing ASIC, application-specific integrated circuits for warm electronics part of the space telescope. So how do you think, what practical benefits can NASA bring to the mankind? Well, that's, that's kind of a hard question, actually. Uh, even in the United States, some people think that there is uh, there is no reason to fund NASA. Like, as you know, NASA has very uh, huge funding. I wouldn't say huge in terms of American taxpayer dollars, but it, it's, it's still very substantial funding. So it's more than $10, $10 billion a year. And some people think that there is no need for that. Like, what actual benefits do we get from space exploration? Uh, well, there are, there are a couple of different benefits, first of all. we uh, our lives in this planet is numbered. We, we're, we're, we're good, probably, you and I, because we're, we're, we're probably going to live 50 more years right from now. But uh, eventually, life in this planet might become extinct. So we, we need to get out of, out of this planet at some point. And so uh, there are a few missions at NASA where they're actually looking for different planets that might sustain human life. And probably 100 years from now, we'll be able to achieve uh, a space travel to a different planet and then would we'll be able to settle there. In fact, um, NASA, along with SpaceX, um, ha have had this project for so many years, they want to colonize Mars. They want to actually send people to Mars to live there. One way, one way ticket, you just get in a spaceship and you go to Mars and that's, that's your home from now on. Um, but other than that, other than the uh, space exploration side of it, uh, technologies that have been developed at NASA have been widely used in, in commercial fields. Um, so that something is being developed for some other reason, right? So the main reason of the technology is to, s to explore space, but it doesn't mean that they cannot be applicable to something else, something a consumer good. Some, uh, like the cell phone that you're using has a camera on it, right? So, and that camera is really small. And but you remember back in the day, the cameras were huge. So that technology, uh, active pixel technology that our cell phones use nowadays have been developed at NASA. And the main reason w for that was to make cameras smaller so that astronauts can take clear images uh, in space or on the moon during Apollo missions. In general, scientific achievements uh, are not one directional. They can happen in uh, some different uh, application, but then later on they, they can be applied to, uh, to something else, something a, a normal uh, person uh, can use. Like the example I gave you before uh, with, the, uh, with, with the smartphone cameras that was developed at NASA. And from on top of my head, there's one more technology that I know of for certain that was developed at NASA. That's an, an anti-icing system on aircrafts. Uh, that was first developed at NASA for, for NASA rockets because uh, you cannot have an ice buildup on the rocket, otherwise it won't function properly. But later on that has been implemented to, uh, uh, <coughs> to any commercial airplanes and it is, it's widely used nowadays. So in general, technologies can be um, 
developed and the first applied for something else but later on that that same technology can be applied to uh, different aspects of human life like for example we had formula one in, in Baku recently right uh, there are a lot of technologies that has been first developed at formula one for racing purposes only so because the main purpose of formula one engineers and scientists is to win win races right they don't care about anything else they don't care about production cars or anything at all but they develop technologies for that reason and they make their cars better every day and some of those technologies are applicable to the production cars so the cars that we're driving on the streets uh, have some technologies that has been first derived uh, from Formula One racing like for example traction control um, I don't know the exact date has been developed it's, it's been on the market for quite some long for quite, quite a long time but I know for a fact uh, that it was the Formula One technology and traction control is when the uh, when the pavement becomes slippery so, so you're using losing control of your of your car uh, and there's some sensors that that kick in and they through the negative feedback they keep you on the road right and and cars nowadays uh, newer cars have that technology already embedded in them so um, in generally scientists don't necessarily know what they're inventing or what they're developing uh, the, uh, the main objective of, of scientists I is to explore science right like um, Maxwell laws right Maxwell laws govern all electromagnetic phenomena that th that's in the universe but the f when Maxwell first came up with those laws he didn't foresee cell phones or a radio or satellites right like he didn't know any of those he just he was a scientist and that's where the engineering comes in Eng engineering is is a bridge between science and uh, functionality science and usefulness right so let's say there's a um, at CERN at, at particle acceleration um, center there's there's some new founding right they, they, they find something that at at first glance doesn't seem to be applicable to anything that we would ever need right but who knows maybe 50 years from now an engineer comes along and is like alright so we can use this technology to make this device uh, to f do something that is useful for, for mankind. What your advice would be for younger generation in their profession choices? I would say they should follow their dreams. Um, whatever they want to do, there's always a way. Don't, don't ever give up. Always follow your dreams. And well, sometimes you might not end up where you would want to be, but if you're actually, if you have, if you work hard through uh, hard work and dedication, you might get to really close to where you want to be. And that will be my advice to follow their dreams and work hard. And what about your further plans? Would you like to return to Azerbaijan and put the knowledge you gained during this years into practice in our country? Of course, yeah, this is, this is my motherland. I feel like I belong here. I'm here on a vacation and I just walk around the city. I, I, f I feel this is my home. And yes, to answer your question, I, I would. I have never uh, received any job offer or anything like that from Azerbaijan, but if I would, I would consider that. Thank you, Mr. Askarov, for Thanks comprehensive for replies me. to the questions. Thank we you. wish you best of luck in your further activities. Thank you. This was Attila Askarov, junior electrical engineer at NASA. We talked about his career and his achievements. Goodbye, stay tuned.